Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. If you remember where we ended in our first session, we ended with sort of a list of five things. Uh, if you could say that the Bible's one story, you could organize it into five parts. And here are the five parts. First of all, there's a prelude, that which happened in eternity past. Second, there's an introduction, and that's the creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Then there's Act 1, the fall and the continuing fall of humanity, Genesis chapters 3 through 11. Then there's Act 2, God's drama of redemption. And that goes all the way from Genesis chapter 12 to Revelation chapter 19. And then finally, there's the postscript of the resolution of all things, Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Now, if you notice, one of those is much longer than the other. Number four is much longer. All the way from Genesis chapter 12, it has 65 and a half books of the Bible, or more than a half in it. Because that's by obviously the longest section of the biblical attention that's given to these points. So what we're going to do now in this section is just simply walk through these one by one. And you'll notice I'll give less attention to one, two, and three, and then to number five. And we'll give most our attention to the longest of the five, that is number four. So where do we begin? Well, I would say we begin at the beginning, but I say let's begin even earlier than the beginning. You know how the Bible starts, don't you? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But have you ever stopped to consider that there were things that existed and things that happened before God created the heavens and the earth? You see, you could say that the story of the Bible begins with God himself because God was before the beginning. When it says, in the beginning God created, that means before anything was created, there was God. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us uh, somewhat about this. It, it tells us in um, Psalm uh, 93 verse 2, your throne is established from of old, you are from everlasting. You know, sometimes people really trouble themselves over the questions. They, they, they trouble themselves with the question, well, where did God come from? Who created God? Friends, the answer to those questions is found in the very definition of God, that God is the uncreated being, that he's eternal, that he has no beginning, that he has no end. Now, this is demonstrated in many passages of Scripture, but God is infinite. He's eternal. He's unchangeable. He's a perfect being. And in God, everything begins, continues, and will end. So in eternity past, before God created anything, before there was simply God himself, God wasn't alone. God existed in three persons. There was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, in John chapter 17, Jesus made specific mention in his prayer to God the Father, talking about the glory that they shared before anything was created. There was a relationship of love and fellowship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And living in that existence... God in his perfection, before anything was created, God launched the plan to fulfill his purpose that would ultimately, as we saw in the last session, gather together all things as one in Christ Jesus. And listen, friends, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that on the good end, don't you? Of God gathering together, I want to be following along with that plan. So that's the first stage to think of as God existing and working in eternity past. You know, one way we can know that God said that he resolved all things in eternity past was because there's a passage in the Bible that says this. 
that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. In other words, before anything was created, the sacrifice of Jesus in the plan of God was already known and accomplished in the heart of God. Now, it would take many thousands of years until that would actually be carried out. But in God's heart and mind, it was an accomplished fact. So that's eternity past. Then what happened? Well, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we speak of this in just a few sentences, but it's massive. You could almost say that as far as the world we interact in, it's everything. It's true that God created the heavens and the earth, and if you understand and believe that, then the rest of the Bible is not hard to believe. Well, how could Jesus rise from the dead? Because God created the heavens and the earth. He has power over all things. Now, how could Jesus walk on water? Because God's the creator of heaven and earth. He can do all things. How could Joshua pray a prayer and by all appearance the sun stopped in the sky? Because God's the creator of heaven and earth. If you can believe Genesis 1-1, you can believe the rest of the Bible. Now, Knowing that is one of the reasons why the devil and his agents, whether they are his knowing agents or his unwitting agents, have done this master stroke of demonic strategy in the last 150 years to wean so many people from the idea that God is their creator. But friends, make no mistake about it. This universe didn't happen by accident. This earth didn't happen by accident. Humanity didn't happen by accident. You didn't happen by accident. Listen, even if your conception was not planned by your father and mother, it still was not an accident because it was in the plan of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Friends, if God is the creator of all, then it means that we have an inherent obligation to him as our creator. And I understand. Sometimes we think that we have an obligation to God because we are his people. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I have an obligation to God. And maybe somebody out there who doesn't give a thing about God, or maybe even they're an atheist, maybe we kind of feel, well, they don't have an obligation to God. Oh, yes, they do. They have an obligation to God on the basis of the fact that he is their creator and that makes them obliged to honor God, to obey him, and even to love him. And when God created the universe, isn't it interesting that he created a world that has the principle within it of cause and effect, now, that principle of cause and effect means a lot of things, but I'll tell you one thing it means. It means that actions have consequences. That's such a simple principle, isn't it? But how easily we forget it in our day-to-day -day lives. How many times have I done something foolish, done something harmful, telling myself all along, this won't have any consequence. Friends, the principle of cause and effect in the universe means many things, but one important thing it means is that actions have consequences, and that leads us into the third stage already of God's plan. We started with the prelude or before the beginning, then there was the creation when God created everything, that's in Genesis chapters one and two, but when we come to Genesis chapter three, what do we have? We have the fall of humanity. But, but I want to tell you something. The fall of humanity is not just described in Genesis chapter 3, even though that's where you're going to find Adam and Eve and the serpent and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That, that's where you're going to find all that. But the fall is actually continuing into Genesis chapter 4 and 5 and 6 all the way through chapter 11, at least in the way that I like to understand it and explain it. Think about the fall. You could call this act one. Adam sinned. 
And that had consequences. Cain sinned, and that had consequences. Humanity turned from God in a radical way, and that had consequences. And even after the flood, humanity turned against God. That had consequences. Friends, think of how ruinous the fall of the human race was. Okay, Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, would you not agree that they sinned? Boy, I need to be careful with my wording here, Pastor Joshua. I don't want to say anything heretical. But wouldn't you agree that at least in some sense, Adam and Eve sinned in a small way? Now, I don't want to act as if it was a small sin. Every sin is significant before a great God. But eating something you shouldn't eat is, relatively speaking, a small sin. And everybody who's ever tried to keep on a diet to lose a little bit of weight knows what it's like to eat something you shouldn't eat. Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God. Make no bones about it. It was a rebellion against God. It was responsible for the fall of the human race. But I want you to notice, as far as the Bible is concerned, they went from this relatively insignificant sin of eating something that they shouldn't eat. And what is the next significant sin in the Bible? I'm not talking about what Adam and Eve did after they sinned in the sense of, you know, blaming one another and shifting the blame and trying to cover themselves. No, what's the next significant sin by a person in the Bible? It's when Cain murdered his own brother. Friend, wouldn't you say... That going from eating something you shouldn't eat to murdering your own brother is to fall pretty fast? And what did humanity do after that? Did they improve? Did, did humanity say, no, we can do better. We can improve. We can fix this. We don't have to keep falling down. No, before many generations had passed, humanity became so corrupt that God said, I'm going to cleanse the earth with a flood and keep alive only eight, Noah and his family. God started that all over again. And wouldn't you think humanity learned their lesson after that? Okay, we didn't learn our lesson in the Garden of Eden. We didn't learn our lesson after the flood. But, 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 but now after the, no, we're going to get it right now. What's the next significant rebellion of, God, of man against God? At the Tower of Babel. You know, the Tower of Babel was very bad, folks. Not only was it man's disobedience to God, it was man's defiance against God. Because they built the Tower of Babel so that it wouldn't leak water. They thought God might flood the world again and they didn't trust his word. So mankind kept falling. Why? Because actions have consequences. Now friends, there are many people Maybe some people here this evening, they don't like God's story. They think God should have written another story, a different story. They think God should have written a story where there's no pain, no suffering, where there's no consequence to our actions. Friends, don't you think it would be strange to think that the whole point of the universe is so that I would not have any pain or discomfort? And it would be strange to think that my actions should have no consequence, that what I do has no real meaning or importance. And it's also very strange to me to think that some of the people who think that God has no right to judge humanity, they feel just fine judging God. Now please, don't get me wrong. We don't deny the great pain and suffering in our world. And we're not going to wish it away with positive thinking. And when we look at the world around us, we must say that we do not live in the best possible world. One less thief, one less rape, one less murder, one less corrupt politician would make it a better world. 
So if God is all-powerful, why did not God make this the best possible world? Well, let me tell you what I think at least part of the answer is. It's found in understanding what the best possible world is. You see, many people have the instinctive thought that the best possible world is the world of innocence. The world that has never known pain, never known sin, never known suffering, that that would be the ultimate existence, the world of innocence. But let me tell you something. Please listen carefully. That's not God's opinion. God's opinion is that there is something greater than the world of innocence, and that is the world of redemption. God creates something greater in his work of redemption than he even did in creating the world of innocence. Let me see if I can explain it to you with a phrase that I hope makes sense to you. We gain more in Jesus than we lost in Adam. Didn't we lose in Adam? You better believe we did. And every sin and all of its effects throughout all generations can be tied back ultimately to the sin of Adam. Even though his sin was a true act of rebellion, but it was relatively minor, yet it was rebellion against a holy God. And it launched a cavalcade, a, a, a cascade of sin that is echoed throughout every generation. We see it, we feel it, we hurt from it. But let me tell you what's even greater than Adam's sin. It's the redemption that Jesus Christ brings. And that's why God allowed sin into the world. To bring forth something greater than the world of innocence. You see, if you think of Adam in the Garden of Eden, there he is. He has a lower status before God than the child of God redeemed by Jesus Christ today. God has done that and he's raising that up. You see, for God to have the allegiance and love of creatures who to be more than robots, sin and rebellion had to be allowed. And if God is going to allow sin and rebellion, he has to allow it. He can't just allow it when we want it and stop it when we want them to stop it. So friends, let me tell you this. This is not the best possible world, but I'll tell you what it is. It is the best possible way to the best possible world. And that's what God's doing in the world right now. The best possible world is the world in which all things are resolved in Jesus Christ. They're all summed up in him according to the eternal mystery of his will described back in Ephesians 1.10. In that best possible world, all righteousness is rewarded. All true evil is properly judged. It is the resolution of all things in Jesus. Now let me say again, there may be times when we don't like God's story, when we would say, no, that's not how I would have done it. I, I would have given Adam and Eve no possibility to sin. Humanity would have never known sin, but friends, they would have never known the glory of God's redemption. Friends, God planned it so that a world that allows sin and suffering is the best possible way to the best possible world. And when God did that, he did that knowing that he himself would enter into the pain and suffering of humanity. Isn't that amazing? That in the incarnation, when Jesus Christ, God the Son, added humanity to his deity and came and walked among men, 
He came and lived a life that shared in the pain and suffering that we experience because God didn't just stand off from a distance and think about what humanity experienced. He came down and shared in it in the most personal way possible. That's how loving and gracious our God is. Well, that's the fall. Man fell in the Garden of Eden and kept falling. And then, at Genesis chapter 12, we come into Act 2. Point number four. Remember, you had the prelude, what God did before the beginning. Then you had the beginning, the creation. Then you had Act 1, that was the fall. And then you have Act 2, which is God's unfolding plan of redemption. And let me tell you, the best way, or at least maybe I should say, my favorite way of explaining God's plan of redemption, it's through the great covenants that God made. And it's very convenient because Genesis chapter 12 begins one of the great covenants that God made with humanity, a covenant that would point forward towards the redemption of humanity, and that's the the covenant God made with Abraham. So look, if you will, with me now, at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God came to Abraham and gave him this promise. Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to promise you a land. I'm going to promise you a nation. And I'm going to promise you a blessing. Now, who was Abraham when God came to him and made this promise to him? Abraham lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. You know what we would call that land generally today? Well, today it's in the modern nation of Iraq. In ancient times, they would have called it Chaldea or Babylon. Friends, Abraham was an idol-worshipping Babylonian when God came to him and said, I'm going to give you a land, a nation, and a blessing. Now, I say he was an idol-worshipping Gentile. Well, m- maybe not. But I'll tell you this, he came from a family of idol-worshipping Babylonians, no doubt about it. The Bible says so. Abraham came from a family of idol-worshippers. You know, the the ancient rabbis used to make up stories about Abraham. And I want to stress, the story I'm going to tell you right now is a made-up story. It's not true at all. But the, the rabbis would tell this story about Abraham that Abraham's father owned an idol shop. I don't know what they called it. Idol Mart, something like that. He owned a shop where they sold idols. And one day, uh, Abraham's father wanted to go out to lunch. So he said, Abraham, I'm going to leave you in charge of the store. I'm going to go out and go to lunch. When I come back, make sure everything's okay. Abraham said, okay, dad, thank you. So as soon as his dad left, this is what Abraham did, was he took the biggest idol in the shop, And he put it in the middle of the room. And then he arranged all the smaller idols in a circle around the big one. Then Abraham took out a hammer and he smashed all of the smaller idols. Destroyed them all. And then he laid the hammer at the feet of the big idol. Then when his dad got home from lunch, his dad was crazy with anger. Abraham, you've ruined us. We don't have any idols to sell. Our inventory is gone. We're going to be poor. What have you done? And you know what Abraham told his father? He said, Father, I didn't destroy those idols. Look, the hammer's right at the feet of the big one. The the big one got angry with all the other ones, and he decided to smash them. Well, did I tell you that this is just a story? It's not really true. According to the story, Abraham's father got even more angry. And he said, Abraham, you know that these idols can't do anything. How how can you say? How can you blame it on the idol? They can't do a thing. 
And then Abraham said, yes, just like a rabbi would say, ah, yes, Father, then why do we worship and sell these idols if they can't do anything? Friends, that's just the story. We don't know what Abraham's relationship with God was before this, but we know in Genesis chapter 12, God came to Abraham and he said, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a nation, and I'm going to give you a blessing. Does everybody know where the land was that God promised Abraham? Today we call it Israel. Actually, if you would get technical, it's a little bit larger than what we call today modern day Israel, but approximately it's the land of Israel today. That's the land. Does anybody know the nation that came from Abraham? Well, specifically, several nations came from Abraham. But God chose one nation that came from Abraham to be his descendants and to receive this promise. And that was the nation of Israel, the people of the Jewish descent, the Jewish people, the Hebrews. The land, the nation, and what was the blessing? That through Abraham, every family on earth would be blessed. Friends, that blessing was the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Abraham, it's through you that the Messiah is going to come to the world. A land, a nation, and a blessing. So God made this covenant with Abraham. He repeated it to him again and again. And from Abraham came covenant descendants. You see, Abraham didn't just have a son. Abraham had two sons. Or if you really want to get technical, Abraham had five sons. I take that back. Seven sons. The first son he had was Ishmael. The second son he had was Isaac. But do you remember, this is a good one for Bible trivia to trap people. After his wife Sarah died, Abraham married again a woman named Keturah, and he had five sons through Keturah. We don't talk about those sons much at all, but it's true. Now, anyway, the son Ishmael was not going to receive the covenant. Isaac received the covenant. Then Isaac grew up, and he had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Only one of them was going to receive the covenant. Esau did not receive the covenant, but Jacob received the covenant. And then Jacob had how many sons? Twelve sons. And they all received the covenant. Not all Abraham's sons received the covenant. Not all Isaac's sons received the covenant. But all Jacob's or Israel's sons received the covenant. And those became the 12 tribes of Israel. And what happened to those 12 tribes? Well, so that God could preserve them in a time of great famine, he brought them down into Egypt, where God had sent before, through the actions of sinful men, Joseph's brothers, he had sent Joseph there to save the world in a time of coming famine. But all that this did was bring the people of Israel down into Egypt, where they remained for hundreds of years until God raised up Moses to deliver them from their slavery in Egypt. God used Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They came into the wilderness. And where did they come? They came to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, God made a second covenant with Israel. The first significant covenant was with Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. But then there was the covenant that God made at the time of Moses. And we're going to look at this in Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 through eight, look at this covenant that God made with Israel. Now, friends, I often say that when you read the Bible, it should be like a movie running in your head. As I read this, picture the scene as it's happening. Ready? So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins 
and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. What a scene. Would you have liked to have been there? Maybe you'd be in the front row of that crowd and you'd feel the sacrificial blood of those oxen splashing on your face as the blood of the covenant and Moses splashed out the blood on the people of Israel. Friends, this was a blood covenant that God made with the people of Israel. He said, I'm going to choose you as a nation. You shall be to me like a kingdom of priests. Now, make no mistake, God had always had a heart for the whole world. We see that throughout the Bible. It's not as if God cared only for Israel, only for the Jewish people. No, not at all. But God said, I'm going to work in a special way through this people, through this nation, and through them, I'm going to do a work that will touch the whole world. And as the basis of that, God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. That covenant had three aspects. Do you remember when I told you about the Abrahamic covenant? What were the three aspects that I mentioned of the Abrahamic covenant? Land, nation, and blessing. What are the three aspects of the Mosaic covenant? Some people call it the Sinai Covenant. Some people call it the Old Covenant. Whatever. Let's just call it the Mosaic Covenant. The covenant made at the time of Moses. The three aspects of the Mosaic Covenant are law, sacrifice, and the choice. What was the law? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of laws that God gave to Israel. What's the count that the rabbi gives? 613, something like that? And God gave his law to the people of Israel and said, I want you to keep it. Now, did God think it was possible for them to keep it in perfection? No. So that's why he gave them the second aspect. There was the law, but then there was also the sacrifice. The sacrifice was necessary because they couldn't perfectly keep the law. Now, not every sacrifice that God gave to them was for the atonement of sin. There were sacrifices given for many different purposes, but one of the important aspects of sacrifice was for the atonement of sin, what in their thinking was the covering of sin. It would be covered so that it would not be an offense before God. It wasn't taken away. No, that could only happen with the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but sin could be covered over by obedience to the animal sacrifice system that God implemented in Israel. There was law, and then there was sacrifice, but then there was the choice. You see, in the, in the um, Mosaic Covenant, God made an arrangement with Israel. He said this to Israel, I am going to glorify myself through you. I'm paraphrasing an idea here. I'm not quoting a verse. I will glorify myself through you. It's up to you how I will glorify myself. And what God gave them was the choice between blessing and cursing. In the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, and then later on fulfilled in the book of Jeremiah, there was a very specific ceremony that the people of Israel were to carry out when they came into the promised land, and this is what they were supposed to do. They were to call out blessings and cursings, and they were to give all the blessings that would come if they obeyed God's law. Now, they didn't have to obey it perfectly. Where they disobeyed, they had to sacrifice. They had to obey it in general, and then use sacrifice for where they didn't keep it. That was the law that God gave to them. Now that's number one. But then there was the curse that would come from disobedience. Friends, God also promised Israel. Basically, he said, if you you obey me, I'll bless you. I'll bless you so greatly that all the nations of the world will know that it had to be Yahweh. It had to be God himself who blessed you. But if you disobey me, 
I'm going to curse you so greatly that all the world will know that no nation could be so cursed and still survive if God was not behind it some way. And friends, that blessing and cursing became the legacy of the history of Israel. You see, there were times when Israel was generally obedient to God. I'll give you an example. In the days of Solomon... Now, Solomon later fell away, but in the early part of his reign, Solomon was an amazing king. And Israel, after the reign of David and in the early part of Solomon's reign, they were so obedient to God that God so blessed them. He blessed them with peace. He blessed them with prosperity. He blessed them with fame. He blessed them with just a marvelous kingdom, so much so that the queen of Sheba came to Solomon and said, I know that there's a God in heaven because I see how much you're blessed. That's what God promised them if they obeyed. But if they disobeyed, God said, I'm going to bring so much judgment upon you. You'll still survive, but the whole world will know that there's no people that could survive such great judgment unless God was in it somehow. And friends, has that not been the legacy of the Jewish people? Law, sacrifice, and the choice. Now, all of that, especially the curse, was to show them their great need for a Savior, the Messiah, as shown by the third covenant. Okay, we've had two covenants so far, haven't we? Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant. Here's the third covenant, the Davidic covenant. And I like this one because my name's David. Turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading in the middle of verse 11. Now, you know something of King David, don't you? He's the one who killed Goliath. But David was so much more than a giant killer. He was a tremendous king. He was the greatest human king that Israel ever had. I'm leaving Jesus Christ, the king of kings, out of this. He was the greatest human king that Israel ever had. And at one point in his reign, God made an amazing promise to David. Look at it here, starting in the middle of verse 11, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Friends, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the story of how this covenant came about. It came about in a wonderful and glorious way. You can just read the preceding chapter and a half of uh, 2 Samuel and get that picture. But this is what I want to communicate to you. This promise was filled in anticipation in Solomon, David's son, but it would be fulfilled in perfection in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This is what God promised, that the Messiah would come from the house of David, that the Messiah would be of his royal lineage, that the Messiah would sit on the throne of David, and that would be a kingdom that had no end and would reign forever and ever God said that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. Isn't it fascinating that of all the titles for Jesus, one of the most frequently used titles for Jesus in the New Testament is this, Son of David. Now, was Jesus a son of Judah? Yes, he was. Was he a son of uh, Jacob? Yes, he was. Was he a son of Isaac? Of course. Was he a son of Abraham? Yes, he was. Was he a son of Noah? Of course. Was he a son of Adam? He was all of those things. But God made a special connection between David 
in Jesus. Jesus Christ is the son of David. And if you want to say there are three characteristics there, God promised David a house, a throne, and the Messiah. So friends, we have three covenants so far. The covenant made to Abraham, the covenant made to Moses, or not made to Moses, but to Israel in the days of Moses, and the covenant made to David that the Messiah would come through him. But you know what? All of those covenants would be incomplete without the fourth and greatest covenant that I'm going to talk to you about this evening. The fourth and the greatest covenant is called the new covenant. And for that, let's talk whether the new covenant is promised in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, Jesus instituted the new covenant. He instituted it on the night of his, uh, the night before his crucifixion. Do you remember when Jesus sat with his disciples at the last supper and he presented to them the cup, one of the Passover cups, part of the Passover meal? And this is what he said. He said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus was making an announcement not only to his disciples, but to to every demon in hell and every angel in heaven. Jesus was proclaiming, what I do tomorrow, my sacrificial death and the resurrection following, that is going to institute the new covenant that God promised. Now, God promised the new covenant in several places in the Old Testament, but I want to look now at Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 24. Here it is. Uh, Excuse me, 31, starting at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Friends, the new covenant, I don't think I can summarize it with just three points. It's a new covenant, a different covenant. It's a covenant of inner transformation. It's a covenant of intimate transforma- uh, knowledge of God and relationship with him. It's a covenant of total forgiveness. It's a covenant of gathering the people of Israel. It's a covenant of cleansing. It's a covenant of true inner transformation. It's a covenant of the outpoured spirit. It's a covenant of the reigning king the Messiah. But if I did have to summarize it, I would say this, that it was a gathering of Israel, a cleansing and a spiritual transformation of the people, and then the reign of the Messiah over the whole world. Friends, make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ did something radical when he consciously, purposely, specifically said, I will now establish the new covenant with my death. You know, I spoke to you before how the Mosaic covenant was established with a blood sacrifice. So was the Abrahamic covenant. Not so much the Davidic covenant. But the new covenant was certainly certified, established with a blood sacrifice the sacrifice of God's only son. And the new covenant established by the blood of the new covenant means that what Jesus left behind was a new covenant community. You could say that one way to understand the book of Acts is Acts is the history of the new covenant community. And the letters of the New Testament are letters of teaching and guidance and instruction to the new covenant community. Friends, if there's any principle I want you to understand, and you can go back and read those passages in the Old Testament that speak about the old covenant, please understand 
that we deal with God under the terms of the new covenant, not the Mosaic covenant, not the old covenant, but God has given us a new and better way to relate with him, and that's on the terms of the new covenant. That's why you're born again. That's why you're filled with the Spirit. That's why your sins are forgiven. It's all based on the terms of the new covenant. And God will accomplish his work since the time of the book of Acts to the end of the age through that new covenant community, which we call the church, his people. That's God's purpose. All right, that's through four. You have the preview part, the beginning part, before the beginning. Then you have the very beginning, the creation. Then you have the fall Then you have God's unfolding plan of redemption through the covenants, including the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and most importantly, culminating in the new covenant. And then what do you have after it all? You have God wrapping all things together in the book of Revelation. Let me read to you now for the last passage we're going to read here this evening. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3, 4, and 5. You see, All the earlier chapters of the book of Revelation are really building up to this point. In many ways, most of those chapters are describing some of the cataclysm that will come to the world before we get to these chapters of consummation, chapters 21 and 22. So I'm going to read to you from Revelation chapter 22, starting at verse 3. Ready? And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Friends, this is the world that God has been working for ever since the Garden of Eden. This is the world of redemption that God has brought about. The world where there is no more curse, God has redeemed everything. A a world where his servants shall serve him. By the way, did you see that phrase in verse three? His servants shall serve him. Friends, I don't know how, I don't know what, but in heaven we're gonna serve God. It's not just gonna be one long worship service, as glorious that would be. We're gonna serve him some way. How are we gonna serve him? I don't know, but I know that his servants shall serve him. That'll be part of what we do in heaven. Serve the Lord. No more curse. His servants shall serve him. But maybe the best is right there in verse four. Did you see that phrase? They shall see his face. Heaven will be a place where God's people see his face. A place of intimate face-to-face fellowship with God. We will see Jesus more clearly than we ever have before. Sin will be done away with. Care and worry will be done away with. Idols will be done away with. Friends, this will be the greatest glory of heaven. To know God, to relate to him, to walk in his presence. So much so that it says that his name shall be on his foreheads and there will be no more night it ends all with saying in verse 5, they shall reign forever and ever. How long is it? Forever. Well, not just forever. Forever and ever. However long that is. Friends, at the end, everything is perfectly consummated. There's no more curse. That's a perfect restoration. There's a throne in their midst. That's perfect administration. His servant shall serve him. That's perfect subordination. They'll see his face. That's perfect transformation. His name will be on our foreheads. That's perfect identification. God will be our light. That's perfect illumination. And we will reign forever. That's perfect exaltation. All that will be ours at the consummation of all things. That glorious consummation only comes from a world where God has allowed sin and the consequences of real choices to exist. So dear brother, sister, 
I don't mean to make any light at all of the pain and the misery you've endured in life, the injustices that were done against you, the, the, the burdens that you've borne, maybe nothing that other people have done to you, but just, just circumstances or illness or, or injury, just things have gone badly for you and you wondered, why can't it be different from this? I want you to know a few things. First of all, I want you to know that Jesus Christ entered this world to share your experience so that you could enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. But number two, I want you to know, and I want you to know it deeply, that it's because of this great plan that God makes the promise that all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, as Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. I want you to notice this. God said all things work together. He didn't say any one thing in isolation. You take any one painful experience in our life in isolation, and it seems to make no sense. It's devastating. But when you put it in context of God's marvelous unfolding plan of the ages, you see that, Lord, you will find a way to even work that together with other things for good. What we can't see of this now, we will see it with crystal clarity when this last phase of God's eternal plan, this perfect consummation, is put into place. Therefore, brothers and sisters, do not lose heart and realize just to bring it back to where we began with, how much better this story is than your own story that you would just try to enlist Jesus to be an a, a actor in your story. No, forget about that. Whatever script you've written for your own life, rip it up. You're, you're not the screenwriter. You're not the actor. You're not the director. You say, no, Jesus, you write the script You be the director. Uh, Just give me whatever role you want to do and I want to be a part of your marvelous plan of the ages. God will work that out and do it for his glory and for your good. Father, that's our prayer. Lord, I'll admit these things seem so glorious that in some sense they seem beyond us. Lord, even if they're beyond us, they're not beyond you. The God who created the heavens and the earth with a word is able to accomplish everything that he promised. And so we rest in that. And we pray that, Lord, throughout all of this, that since Jesus Christ is the focus of this whole plan from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, we pray that Jesus Christ would be exalted in our life as we let him have his rightful reign among us. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.